you know sharing this uh, platform with you guys I appreciate the NIMEC executive for giving me the opportunity to um, impact the little knowledge I have on you guys and um, as you can see I'm a lecturer with the Federal University of Technology Akure. I'm uh, in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and yeah we do a lot of, a lot of uh, cool stuff I can't start talking about that now uh, but then today's uh, technical session is going to be centered on control systems and applications. I actually have a slide, uh, we're going to be teaching from the slide. I'm going to put you through the fundamental idea uh, behind the theory of control systems and then from there we're going to move on to uh, playing with a couple of problems uh, in MATLAB. I think it's going to be wonderful when we start that. And then I'm going to actually look at a practical example and then with that example, we're going to see how we can actually model your own systems and then probably tweak or optimize the system parameters to get the best or the most desirable performance. Uh, so let's get started. You're welcome. Okay, yeah, I think, yeah, okay. Uh, yes, so I hope you can see the slides I have prepared. I let me see. Okay, so yeah. Okay, so control systems, basic theory, and elementary application. Actually, it's just one application, but then I would have actually taken a lot more. But then the time we have would not be sufficient. So let's dive in and really, really check stuff out. Now that's the outline I have. We have the introduction, system modeling and response, system stability, and MATLAB implementation. I hope to do that in the next 45 minutes or so. Yeah, uh, now the thing is this, I think I should probably give a background on control systems because it, it's really, it's something, you know, a lot of you guys may not have actually gotten to that level where you get to really, really study control systems for what they are. In my university, in my department, control systems is taken by 400 level students. That's year four student, that is the year for the graduate. And I don't know how it works in your own school or probably where you do your stuff. But the general idea is that you have a, an assemblage of components that perform a specific task. That's the fundamental idea of a system. But then when we talk about system in engineering, it's, it's, it does way more. I don't really want to go straight into the theory. I just want to give an idea of what or the application, the possible applications. Now, the first thing that comes to mind for an average student, you know, is how a plane, you know, how a, a complicated device, say a plane, for example, machine, can fly all by itself. I believe we are all familiar with the concept of uh, autopilots. You know, you can imagine, you can imagine that machine. Uh, it can do stuff all by itself. Now, the general idea is this. There are, there are controls. Okay, if you want to turn left, you bank left. If you want to turn right, you bank left. Bank right, rather. You engage the rudder, you engage the ailerons, and uh, the flaps to do all sorts of maneuvers. Now, how does the machine... Now, don't forget we're talking about the aircraft. How does it, you know, take in all of that input and then how does it maintain its attitude? I did a little bit of stuff in aerodynamics. Its attitude, its altitude, and then goes all the way from where it starts, you know, where it takes off to where it lands without or with minimum human intervention. Now that's, that's something that sort of uh, intrigues a lot of young people and probably that's what got us involved in engineering. And closely related to that is the concept of robotics. I think I should have actually put pictures here, but don't mind me. Probably the next, maybe the next time. Now, another thing is robotics. You, know, you have a robot, something that is able to interact with the environment. It takes an input, sensory information. It processes the information or the data, and then makes decision based on the process or the information it extracts from the data it took in. Now, that's just another elementary illustration of a system maybe it's oversimplified but i believe that helps you get the general idea now those are like really really huge things you know you talk about the aircraft and its autopilot a robot and its ability to make decision all by itself 
You get the point. Now, those are like really, you know, large scale or bigger systems. But did you know that something as simple as your toilet flushing mechanism is also, in the manner of speaking, a system? Okay. So I'm not going to probably waste too much on time on that, but then you're going to probably see the reason why this is called a system in the engineering sense of the word. Okay. So let me move on to the definition. Okay, uh, yeah, introduction definition. Now, I've decided to compartmentalize the definition into three major uh, concepts. Now, the first thing about a system in the engineering sense of the word, even in the biological sense of the word, okay, is the fact that it has a number of multiple elements arranged. Okay, an arrangement or a collection of multiple elements. Now, that's the first uh, uh, what's it called now, the first criteria and the second criteria is the fact that these elements or these uh, entities that make up the system are connected now when we say connected, in other words, they have a sense of sharing, they have the means for sharing information, for sharing resources okay that's why the fact that each component or each element has its own function it does not really matter what each does, what really does matter is the fact that they share information and there's a level of dependency based on the fact that they share information okay now let's look at our uh, um let me see now even your body for example i was talking about the fact that a system is not just an engineering uh, concept exactly it, it pervades human society and even the physical world and yes we talk about physical elements the body systems for example your digestive system your respiratory system your excretory system you know when we did biology back in the day, we talk about the, 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 the organization of life. I will talk about cell, from cell to tissue, from tissue, we have organ and, and, a, and a, a collection of organs working towards a specific goal, what we call a system. So we have a similar idea when it comes to engineering, and I hope that helps you understand the concept better. And lastly, in the line of criteria, is the fact that these are able to control whether their own selves or another system. Now, this is a very important thing. We may be familiar with the first two concepts, the arrangement of physical elements, the connection, the fact that they share information, but what makes a system a control system, and that is where it's sort of, that's where the domicile knowledge is for engineering, is the fact that it's able to control either itself or other subsystems or other systems. You get the idea? So as to proceed, I believe you're going to get, I'm, I'm going to show you some other illustrations that help you understand this concept better and then, yes, you get the idea of what I'm trying to say. So I hope that sort of, um, uh, what's it called now, that sort of um, help you understand the general idea behind control systems. Mind you, I didn't give you an official definition because I do not intend this to be some official lecture in that manner of, you know, speaking. I, I, I really prefer that you learn things like... I give you the general idea and then I expect that you do more research and then use what I've given you to be the foundation for building more complex concepts in your mind and then practice that's of course very important. Uh, without much ado, I'm gonna really really I'm gonna be a little bit fast. Okay, um okay, sorry, I just had to sort something out. Okay, yes, now let's move on. Classification. Now when it comes to classification of systems in engineering, we have um uh three basic classifications. The fourth one is more like a miscellaneous classification, but I'm going to discuss when we get there. And the first is, it is either a system is linear or non-linear. Okay? In other words, there are behaviors that determines or describe system linearity. Now, when we talk about linearity in, uh, in, in engineering, it is based on two mathematical concepts and the concept of homogeneity and superposition. The concept of homogeneity relates to proportionality. Okay? In other words, if you if you increase the input by a certain proportion, will the output increase by the same proportion? Now that's homogeneity. A, homo a linear system is homogeneous and it obeys the law of superposition. So let me take that again. A linear system obeys the law of homogeneity and superposition. Homogeneity says that if you increase the input factor or the input parameter by a given factor, the output is also increased in the with this uh, to the same amount or to the same extent by the corresponding factor. I believe that's clear. And next, that's superposition. Superposition talks about um, combination of inputs. 
okay to give a specific output if you have let's say input i1 and if you i2 okay by the time you bring in i1 and i2 will it give you i3 where i3 is exactly a sum of i1 and i2 if i1 and i2 is not or should i say if i3 is not an exact sum of i1 and i2 then superposition is not obeyed in that context so if a system goes the law of homogeneity and superposition, then it is linear. But if it does not obey those two fundamental mathematical laws, then it is non-linear. And we're going to see, sorry, subsequently how that the fundamental thing, what makes a system, what makes us able to really play around with the system is the mathematical model. We'll get to that shortly. Now, the next classification is either if it's time invariant, or it is varying. In other words, the first concept, time invariant, in other words, does not change. It's constant over time. Okay? And then, does it vary? Does it vary? In other words, are the parameters that describe or define the system, do they change with time? And for most systems, we're going to be dealing with in this study. And for most systems that you would see, you know, in, 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 practice, in practice, most are going to actually time variant or varying systems. And next in the line of classification, is um, continuous or discrete don't mind me you're going to see some uh concepts put in brackets suppose they are just pointers to what i'm supposed to do in the next slide don't worry you're going to see what i mean by that in the next slide now continuous or discrete now let me quickly skip to the next slide now you look at the screen now you see I, that should be the top left hand corner you see a, a, a graph so to speak that shows what looks like a sinusoidal function now this is a smooth curve Okay, now the dependent variable is this parameter x of t, and the independent variable is time. t could be anything, but let's say time. Now, this is a shape of a continuous function, and I believe all of us must have done a lot of stuff relating to uh, the shape of a function in mathematics. So I'm not going to really dwell on that that much. In fact, most of what we're going to be talking about in this study are going to be continuous function. Now there is no there is no discontinuity along the line, or along as 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 the dependent variable varies with the independent variable. There is no discontinuity and it is smooth as you can see from here. Okay, and now the counterpart concept is the discrete system. Now look at this, the top right hand corner. You're going to see that the variables are different, and then you see that there is what appears to be like pulses that are instantaneous pulses at different inter at fixed intervals along the horizontal axis that is the n axis you can see that here now a physical phenomenon or phenomena let me not call it phenomena sorry but a physical concept that helps you understand that to a certain degree is your heartbeat but of course our heartbeats are relatively constant so but the point is your heart beats and then it sort of goes down to probably you know systole diastole it goes down and then at a given time t from the first bit or from the last bit it goes up there's a pulse you get the concept and then goes down and then it goes that way along the line now this is largely used in electronic communication i'm not it's it's used in other concepts but whenever it comes to electronic transmission and all sorts of things as you must have, I believe some of you are engineering students, a lot of you perhaps, and um, you must have done stuff uh, in, uh, I believe that is Fourier transforms, yes. So we're going to go discontinuous functions or discrete functions. In fact, a discrete function is an example of a discontinuous function. Okay? So, as you can see in the right hand corner, this is dealt with in an entirely different way compared to this. Now, in between the two, you're going to see a, an image here. Now this image here is um, it's trying to show us how you convert a continuous function, as we can see in the first graph here, to a discontinuous function or a discrete function. And the mechanism, the mathematical mechanism for doing that is called sampling. Okay, that is you sample the amplitude. This is the amplitude measured on the particle axis. The amplitude sample at specific intervals of time. At this, at the, at, at, that is called the period, okay? At this time, t from zero, you sample what the value of the function is, and then you record it 
on a duplicate graph. Now, at another time t now, 2t now, remember t is the period, usually it's denoted by capital T. At time 2t, which is what we have here, you measure or you note the amplitude and then you record it and you mark it out like that. So once that is done all through the process, then you join the tops or the magnitudes and you have what looks like a discrete function extracted or extracted from a continuous function. I hope that's clear. Now, lastly, I, I say there's a classification based on number of inputs and then you have a couple of acronyms here, MIMO, what I call MIMO, CISO, MISO, SIMO. Basically, MIMO is multi-input, multi-output. SISO is single input, single output. MISO talks about multi-input, single output. And SIMO, that's the last one, single input, multiple output. And that's probably what I was trying to depict here. That's what I'm trying to depict. This is not an accurate depiction. Please note. This is not an accurate depiction. This is just like a conceptual uh, image to give you an idea of what I'm trying to talk about. As you can see here, we have multiple inputs coming into this summing junction. And from this summing junction, you have a single output. But then the process is usually way more complicated than this. Please take note of that. I'm going to show you all the stuff as we go that accurately depicts what. Uh, a multi-input, multi-single-input, single-output system looks like. So next, we're going to talk about two major concepts, okay, in control systems, okay? Now we have, um, or what I call types. Now we have open-loop control systems and closed-loop control systems. Okay, before I talk about the comparison, let me, quickly, let me go a step ahead and describe these two. Now, in an open-loop control system, there is no direct um, communication when i say communication in other words there is no direct link okay between the input and the output the output does not depend on the input in any way apart from the fact that an input goes into what you call a controller and then the controller controls the process and we have an output but fundamentally this is the anatomy of a control system okay i think i should even talk about that before i even talk before i relate the concept of open loops and um, control and, and closed loop control systems. Now, you see here, let me do that in a couple of seconds. We have an input. Now, when you are representing a system, there have to be at least four components. Now, the two primary components are the input and the output. I don't think I need to explain that to an extent. And then the auxiliary component, not auxiliary in that sense, but should I say subordinate in order of importance, is the controller. Now the point is this. There's not, there will be nothing to control if you don't have an input. And that's why I said that this is more like an auxiliary, subordinate to the input. Okay, there is an input coming into a controller. Now the point of all the fundamental idea behind having a controller is that it determines how the input affects a process. Okay, now let's say for example you're cooking, you are cooking, you have a gas cooker. Now let me use that to explain this. Now the input would be the heat, is that all right? Okay, now this is a very elementary description, it is not scientific, it's not engineering, it's not accurate in the engineering sense of the word. The input is the heat, you have what you call like that level adjuster, okay, that will be your controller. Now, what's brace you're controlling? Cooking. That is the temperature of the food inside a pot. And the output is a cooked food, that is a food that has been, that, that it has been applied to, to a certain extent, such that it changes the form of the raw material, right? I don't know if that really explains the concept. So that is the fundamental anatomy of a typical control system. We have an input, we have an output, but in between the input and output, you have a controlled process and we have a controller that is that determines how the input is, um, is manipulated, let me use that word, within the process. Is that all right? And I have here an example of something like that. You have an electric motor being a control process and then you have an electric energy coming in and then output. Now you see it's obviously the controller is missing here. And the controller in this sense could be a real start or a gear. Do you get the idea? A gear could be used to control how... Oh, no, not a gear. Let me say a real start because a gear does not exactly interact directly with the electrical 
energy but then a gate can actually come in here somewhere in the process itself but we could actually have a real start in between the electrical energy coming in and the electrical motor itself okay now by the time you adjust the resistance of the coils and all the components within the electric motor it determines how much mechanical energy you get out of the system i believe that is clear the input the output the control and the control process that is very important but then you will see here also that here, that is the bottom image here, the bottom figure. You see there is an extra element added to the control system. In fact, two extra elements. And mind you, before I talk about that, they are what you, we have arrows. Now, the arrows show the direction of flow of signals. That is very important in control systems. Something like a control system, in, 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 in this sense, is analogous to a vector quantity. The ma it, it has both magnitude and direction. Arrows are important because they show, the, they show the direction of flow of signals and how each component interacts with other components, how the controller, for example, interacts with the control process. You get the idea? Now, let me move on to the closed loop system, and this is a block diagram for a closed loop system. We have an input. Now, you see here now there's an extra word attached to the concept. That is the reference input. Okay, wow. I think I'm, I need to move faster of time now it is a reference input and a controlled output now why is that now the thing is this you are trying to compare the output with an input and what makes that possible what you call a feedback loop a feedback loop which is what you see here going from the output to this circular element here that you call a comparator now the comparator compares the reference input that is the input that you, that you desire with the output that you get, it compares them, and then if there is a discrepancy, it sends the information, or should I say it senses the error rather, the error it senses is sent to the controller, and that would determine, okay, should I increase this, should I decrease that? Now you see here that you have two signs, a negative sign, a positive sign. You have a negative feedback, loop and a positive feedback loop. In a negative feedback loop, you are trying to subtract. You have excess elements, okay? You have excess elements and you are trying to subtract and then the information is sent as an error signal here to your controller. Now, once the controller senses the error signal, it pushes the information as a controlled signal to an amplifier now this amplifier is um it's more like uh, it is not compulsory not all systems use amplifiers but in some cases in fact a lot of cases not just some cases the control signal is usually from an electronic device and the voltage uh, let's say whatever control signal or element is usually of a very small magnitude so it has to be amplified say for example you're trying to control a very let's say um, a machine, a heavy duty machine. Now, you control it using, most times you use, um, what, what's the name of this, uh, 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 this mechanical switch. Okay, you control it using mechanical switches. Okay, and uh, they are very, very small. Now, you have to, you have to amplify the mechanical signal so that you can drive a motor. Okay, those mechanical switches are called relays. Okay, or let's say, for example, you want to use a controller, an electronic controller to, uh, you know, drive a process, say, an electric motor. Now, we don't use something that is the size of the motor to control the motor. No, we use an electronic circuit, which usually have DC voltage that are really small. So you have to amplify the voltage to actually have a significant impact on the process. I believe that is clear. So you have a reference input that is the desired input and a controlled output. Okay. There are so many examples in this regard, but because of time, I won't be able to go into those. So that helps us to get the basic idea between an open loop system and a closed loop system. Now, the fundamental differences are presented here. An open loop system is easy to build as it's very obvious here. It's very simple. It doesn't have a lot of elements, so definitely it should be easier. A closed loop system is complex. It's not so easy to build. Usually it has more elements. And then, yes, this is not reliable in the sense that you can compare the output with the inputs to make sure that you get what you actually sent into the system. Now this, by comparison, that is the closed system is more reliable. This is inaccurate, this is more accurate, more stable, less stable. Now, stability is a major concept in control systems, and I'm gonna explain why this is down the line. Now, in the case of 
open loop system you cannot optimize because there's no way to measure your output and it's more like a black box system so you, you can't there's no way to evaluate the per performance of the system and as a result hey you can't make it better because making something better is a general idea of optimization but as long as you can measure as you can do in closed loop system then definitely you can actually make the performance better obviously since this is beauty it follows logically that it should be cheap and this is relatively expensive i should move faster because of time now these are some practical examples now we have here a thickness control machine that is the image you have on the left and the image we have on the right is like a, is, is a nuclear reactor is that all right now i'm going to explain this that is the nuclear reactor because i believe you have a family than with that i probably use screenshots uh the first image here look at it closely in your spare time and you it's, it's very straightforward but because of time i'll be to talk about this for now so let me dwell on the reactor i believe you all know what a nuclear reactor does how it works in a nuclear reactor you have um a, a fissile material that is being subjected to a forced probably fusion or fissile or, or, or fusion reaction and then that is controlled by usually boron rods if you still remember clearly these rods are supposed to use to control or should i say the the, the rods absorb neutrons so the the, the 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 volume or the number of neutrons available in the nuclear reaction will determine how much power you get so if you want more neutrons what do you do you withdraw these boron rods and if you want less neutrons what do you do you insert boron, boron rods into the core so that they actually absorb neutrons so you have less energy so Look at this. I believe that helps you understand. Now, the reaction is exothermic, right? So, as a result, it generates a lot and lots, billions of joules of heat. Okay? And this heat is probably is exchanged with an heat exchanger. Okay? This is transferred to a heat exchanger that is external to the core. And that vaporizes water in a steam generator. And the pressurized vapor is used to drive a turbine. And turbine drives the generator. Now that is the physical modeling, okay? So you will see, I, this, I, I, I like the way this picture is actually, uh, 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 it's, it, it's, it's shown here. It tries to relate the physical model to the control system model. Now, the thing is, is you start with the reference input. Now the reference input is the desired electric power. How many megawatts of energy do you want? Of course, that's based on the design of your reactor. Okay, but in most cases, you don't tend to get that actual power due to a lot of losses that occur down the line. As a result, you have to make adjustments to the system, and that's the concept of making adjustments to the actual output so that you can so that you can match up with desired input is control systems, and we have an equivalent here. Okay, like I said, you have a you have you have you have a desired um, electric power, so. You send signal. Now the signal you are sending is, is um, probably the the mechanism that starts the fusion reaction. Okay, and that eats up the reactor. You know, the critical mass and all of that stuff, and it's and, and 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 you have a chain reaction, and that heats up the system. Okay, now like I said, assuming you are getting less power than you want, what do you do? It means you have too much boron rods in the system. So. <clears throat> You have a measuring device here. Now, in most cases, you would see here, you have, here you have a comparator device, but before you can compare, you have to measure. Okay? So usually, as you can see here now, in this case now, that's the left-hand image, that is the thickness controller. See that there is a measuring device in the feedback loop. Do you get that? But in this case, it is not included, but actually it is. So a measuring device, you measure the output power, you compare it with the increased power, now, if the power is less, what do you do? You actually have a positive feedback loop, as we have here. So in this case, you take the positive sign instead of the negative sign. And then, signal is sent to the boron rod or the control unit, and that withdraws the boron rod, so you can happily have more fissile material in the reactor. And the compass is true for the case, okay? And then I'm gonna talk big briefly about this. And for your information, this image here, sorry about that. So this is relating to this, okay? This is a temperature control system for a room. And this is equivalent uh, 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 representation 
of this system. Now, you have a specified temperature for the room, and then you have, sorry, this should be the specified temperature, that's the reference input is the specified temperature, but then, for whatever reason, the room does not match up with the temperature. Okay, so what happens, or what do you need? You need to either increase the temperature by increasing the energy output of the furnace, or you reduce the temperature by reducing the energy output of the furnace. Okay, now, that controlling element, now we see this now, now you see that this is a process. I think that makes sense to you. This is a process and this is a control element. The switch, which is what we have here, this is more like, uh, now, what does it look like? A bimetallic thermostat. All the mechanics can be employed, but I believe we've all learned about bimetallic strips in our uh, O-level physics. So that is what determines. So if the temperature is higher than a specified um, limit, what do you do? You just disengage. Your bimetallic strip disconnects, and then you, the heating stops. And I guess your heating system is more like a glorified version of your, <laughs> of your uh, pressing iron. I hope that is clear. So because of time, I have to really, really move faster than that. So I'm going to move on to system modeling. Okay. Now, the thing is this. It doesn't matter how clever I am. I can't just know stuff about a system. Say, for example, the room I'm in right now, the temperature. I need something to measure. I need something to determine the relationship between parameters I'm measuring. Okay, first of all, I have to be able to quantify the measure. Sorry about that. I have to be able to quantify the parameters <coughs> that are involved in the system. That is number one. And number two, I must be able to determine the relationship the parameters that are interacting with the system. That takes about the definition of control system. The first definition is one must have a collection of elements. <coughs> Excuse me. Now, the second one is that you must have a connection between those elements. Now, the essence of connection is that they interact with each other, they share information, and do all sorts of things. Do you get the idea? Now, the tool for determining for quantification and for determining the relationship is mathematics. Okay, so whenever we are modeling a system, it, 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 the, the modeling is only possible within the framework of mathematics, at least as far as I know. Okay, so mathematics, that's why mathematics is so important in engineering. In fact, engineering is basically, to me, it is applied mathematics. Basically, engineering is applied mathematics. Okay, now, so the thing is this. In a system, you at least have two variables. At least two variables, one changing with respect to each other to the other one. Now, what does that what does that bring to mind? When one variable or when one parameter is changing with respect to the other one, that's calculus. And that leads us to differential equations. Okay? So differential equations is a set of mathematical equations, mostly calculus, describing the behavior of physical systems when one variable or parameter changes with respect to the other. And that's what I just said. Now, in most cases, the independent variable is time. Not in all cases, but in most cases. And uh, differential equations are only applied in the modern system that can be expressed as continuous mathematical functions. Okay? And lastly, Laplacian transforms. Okay? Now, now the Laplacian transform is a set of um, algebraic rules that uh, helps you determine, or should I say, helps you solve math uh, calculus or differential equations algebraically. I believe you must have come across that in your mathematics, but due to the fact that this is purely uh, an application class, I won't go into the details of all of those things. I hope that is clear. Now, this is a general idea, and I, here I, I have a set of differential equations. Okay, and as you would see here, all these differential equations are linear. Okay, linearity. Now, in the sense of differential equations, linearity is based on the order. Now, there's a progressive reduction of order from the maximum, let's say n, to n minus 1, to n minus 2, up to 0. Now, assuming that one of these formulas, I mean, assuming you go from d4y dx raised to the power 4, you go straight to d2y dx squared, that is non-linear. I hope you're clear. But for what we're going to be doing in this study, it's going to be generally related to linear systems or linear functions. 
Okay, now they actually they actually methodologies for dealing with non-linear systems. Okay, but then that's not going to be focus of our study. And then there's another tool or there's another technique used. They call it linearization. In other words, if you have a non-linear system, there are tools that you can actually use to at least approximate it so that it looks linear, and then you can apply the principle of linear systems to solve them. Okay, now that is the first set of modeling, and most of what we're going to be talking about in this study is going to be based on differential equations as opposed to what we have on the screen at the moment, difference equations. Now, difference equation is used to model uh, discrete systems. And instead of using the Laplace transforms, it uses Z transforms, okay? But like I said earlier, for this study, I, I won't be talking about difference equation. I'm just, I just want to introduce the concept so that you would, you know, be aware of it and should you get the chance, you can actually go through it. I, I think it's a perfect time to learn new stuff. So you can actually check out Z transforms and difference equations. But for the purpose of this study, we're going to be focusing on differential equations. So whip out your engineering mathematical textbooks and let's play around a little. Now, another thing about modeling is this. You would have noticed how... Now, look at this. Now, I mentioned the fact that there is a physical model and then there is a C control system model. Now, you call this a block diagram. We can see my mouse. Okay, now my mouse is here, bottom right hand corner. Now, that is a control system representation. Okay, or a block diagram representation. Do you get the idea? Now, this is a physical model, but this is a control system model, so to speak. Okay, and then this part, this type of control system model is called a block diagram, as you can see. It shows different blocks that represent different components of systems, and then there are arrows going from one block to the other, showing how they exchange information, how they interact with each other. Okay, now, and that's what you have on the left-hand side. That's the top left-hand corner. Now, you will see that this is a little bit complex. Okay, but that's how interesting your control system can get. And mind you, this is a single input, single output system. This is very clear. Now, this is the first methodology for representing control systems. And then we have another methodology called the signal flow graph. Now, this is a signal flow graph. Okay, now, you see that here, instead of having boxes, you have, uh, you have your boxes are represented by what you, by this, by these lines. Okay. And these points, <coughs> sorry about that. <coughs> and then these points, okay, the signals are represented by nodes. Don't, don't forget I told you, these lines are called signal lines. Okay. And these are, these boxes, they can be called transfer functions. I'm going to get to that shortly. I'm going to get to that shortly. Okay, so when you're going from the block diagram to the signal flow graph, the basic idea is represented by what you have in the middle here. Now, look at this system. You have a reference input, an error signal, a control output, we have a forward path gain, we have a feedback path gain, and then here we have a feedback signal. Are we clear? Now, looking at all of this, how do you represent this? Now, the conversion of this is what you have here. Notice that a signal is converted to a node. R of S here, okay, my mouse, okay, my mouse go on the wall. This R of S becomes a signal here. The error signal here becomes another node here. And the controlled signal comes here. Do you get it down? And finally, the feedback signal comes here. Now, you're going to notice another thing here, but let me, not talk, let me just mention it briefly. These are expressed in terms of a variable S instead of T. I'm going to get to that shortly. Okay, good. That's the next slide, but I just wanted to be sure. <clears throat> so, we see here, we have a reference input. The signal lines becomes nodes, and the boxes, which are probably processes, the controllers, the amplifiers, or the measuring devices, they become the signal lines. Now, there are actually instances that it is easier to model your system as a signal flow graph rather than a feedback loop. They are actually systems. Now, this may be more explicit, but this is more useful down the line. And it's a result of the fact that it is easy for you to do a lot of, you can reduce, get the overall system transfer function. Now, look at this. Now, there's a concept called a transfer function, and that's when you try to reduce all of this as it is. Now, this is a feedback loop. We try to reduce a single forward pass gain. That is something like this. In other words, if I try to reduce something, okay, let me go back a little. 
to point out. Yeah, look at this. Now, instead of what I have here, I can reduce something that this is a closed loop transfer function. Closed loop. I can convert it to an open loop. Now, the transfer function I have in an open loop is called an open loop transfer function. I think I shouldn't talk about transfer function here because of understanding. I'm going to skip that for now. I'm going to get that to that later in the slides. But when it comes to um, uh, conceptually modeling a control system, we have the block diagram and we have the missing, sorry, the signal flow graph. Now, a block diagram can be reduced, like I said, this whole thing as it is now can be reduced just this singular figure here. And these are the processes. Because of time, we can't really go into all this. Okay, but I really, really hope you guys get to pick up the test, look after this, and refresh your memory. Okay? You see here that there are different, you know, there's so many rules. I have to reduce this to so give me a single line, and I have to reduce this, I get a single line. Then what I have, I combine these two, I then reduce this, and then I combine the whole thing. Now, this can be very cumbersome when it comes to resolution. This can be very, very cumbersome to resolve. And that is why a lot of uh, modelers, the results to the basic program. Now, you only have to know the formula and be able to deconstruct this in your head. And then in a single formula, you can actually solve the whole thing rather than going through several process of reduction. And that's why in some cases, not all cases, but in some cases, this is preferred. But when it comes to conceptual or intuitive understanding, this is actually preferred. Do you get the kind of idea? When it comes to intuitive understanding of a control system, the block diagram is preferred. But when it comes to the mathematical aspect of reduction, the signal flow diagram is preferred. And you will see here, you have a missing reduction formula. Now, this is a missing reduction formula. I'm not going to go into that. I just want to put the concept across to you. I expect you to check that out later. And don't forget, you can actually control this. I said control. Sorry about that. <laughs> Convert a block diagram to a signal flow graph and vice versa. And the basic idea of what is displayed here. You would also notice that here, you notice you have a negative one here. The negative one here tells you that this is a feedback loop. And of course, that is indicated by the direction of the arrow. The arrow is going back. It's folding back, you know, going back. Unlike this arrow here, this arrow is pointing forward. I do hope that is clear. So these are just conceptual. Like I said, this is basic theory. It's just supposed to introduce the concept. And then I do introduce you to the applications. So I expect you to probably uh, go on. I'll figure out the rest later. Now, I'm almost out of time. Okay, I, I really hope this doesn't really go beyond an hour, but I guess you have to, but I will try to make it as quick as possible without making loose information. Now, the thing is this. Now, you also see here, now we have a um, time domain, we have a Laplace domain, and then we have a frequency domain. Okay, now, in the time domain, that is what you do in your differential equation. But then when you have to evaluate the performance of a control system or a differential equation or a control system that has been combined to a differential equation, then you have to take it into the Laplacian domain. Okay, we're going to get into that shortly in the applications. And then we have a frequency domain. Now, the frequency domain functions in a similar manner to the Laplacian domain, but it is, the frequency domain is more, uh, what's it called now, it is, it is more suitable. It, it, it is something that is, um, it is more suitable to graphical representation of the control systems. So just take it for now, just take it as it is for now. Okay, and then I put something here, the TF. Now the TF is a transfer function now. The transfer function is also known as the gain. Now let's go here a little. Now the transfer function for this system as it is, is the output or the ratio of the output to the input. Okay, and you would see here, as we see here, the mathematical formula connecting these three variables is that c of s is equal to r of s multiplied by g of s. Okay, that is very important. c of s, c of s is equal to r of s multiplied by g of s. For, for any given loop or mini loop, c of s is equal to g of s multiplied by r of s such that the gain or the transfer function for this chain <coughs> or for this part, <coughs> excuse me, is g of s and it's given as c of s over r of s now let's quickly do something like that here now look at this okay this is not very explicit okay not very explicit 
Now, these are the resolution formulas. You can actually look at them briefly. Now, for a forward path, the path gain is, you just multiply these two. And that's what you have here. Now, this is a feedback loop. The way you reduce, okay, this is not the feedback loop, rather. It is the combination of blocks in parallel. You see that here? Now, this is where I was actually going, because this is, you come across this a lot. Okay, now, this is a feedback loop. You see that not all arrows are pointing forward, unlike what you have here and here. You actually have a feedback loop where an arrow is pointing backward. And the mathematical formula for the resolution of those block is this. Okay? In other words, this is the open loop transfer function. What you have here, the reduction you have here, is the open loop transfer function that is given by this g of s over 1 plus g of s multiplied by h of s. Now, you would notice the signs here are dual. So whenever you have a negative feedback loop, the sign here is positive. Whenever this is a positive feedback loop, the sign here is negative. That is very important. This is one of the fundamental concepts in control system. Once you understand it, that helps you simplify a lot of other concepts. Okay? Now, the, con the transfer function for this system now, that is for the mini system I have here, pointing out with my mouse, is C of S over R of S. And C of S over R of S, for this case, is G of S over 1 plus G S multiplied by H S. Now, this is a very important ratio, the transfer function. Okay, it's a very important ratio. Okay. And then the denominator of the transfer function or the gain, another name for the transfer function is the gain, is what you call the characteristic equation. Okay, it's called the characteristic equation. We're going to use that as instability. Let me move forward. Now, how do you, uh, what's it called, measure the performance of a system? Now, we talk about the errors, inherent errors in the system. I'm going to explain that graphically as we go on. The stability of the system, and then we have to talk about the how the response, the response time. Don't worry, I'm going to discuss all these concepts uh, graphically as we move on. And then the last is the cost. How much does it cost to build and implement the system? So these four basic concepts are what's used to select a system over another. Is that right? Okay, good. Now, when we're modeling system mathematically, when we want to test the behavior of a system, there are mathematical concepts or mathematical inputs that you use. Now, there are five major mathematical inputs. We have the impulse function, and the mathematical denotation is what you have here. For an impulse function, now this is a unit impulse function, but for generically speaking, your impulse function is equal to infinity when n or when t is equal to zero. But when t is not equal to zero, when n is not equal to zero, it is zero. In other words, it only occurs instantaneously and it almost immediately goes back to zero for other times. Now, this is one here because it's the unit impulse function. But for a generalized impulse function, it's supposed to be infinity. Is that clear? And now we have the step inputs. Now, for a step input, this value could be anything. One, two, three, four. You see what I have here? For a given interval, it is zero. But then for another given interval, usually the period, it is a constant value, say k. <coughs> now, for this particular system or particular input, sorry, not system, it's a unit step system in the sense that the step value is one. And of course, the next one is a ramped system or a ramped input. What am I saying system? In a ramped input, you have a straight line graph representing the function or representing the input. And in the case of a unit ramp function, the gradient of this ramp is one. Next, we have the sinusoidal function. <clears throat> and lastly, we have the parabolic function. Now, these are used to test the behavior of the system. <clears throat> Excuse me. Now, <clears throat> it is very important we understand that, like I said earlier, the fundamental to use for analyzing control system is a Laplace transform. Okay, the other tools, probably when you get to the, to the frequency domain, and if you are dealing with discrete function, you talk about the Z transforms. But what we're going to be dealing with in this study is largely Laplace transforms. So for a given input, what is Laplace transform? If you have a step value k, k is a constant, the Laplace transform is k over s. And for a special case, where you have a unit step function, and then, of course, k equal to 1. And that's what you have here. For your ramped inputs, this is what you have, a Laplace transform. And then, the special case, where you have a unit step function. Okay, and the Laplace transform of a parabolic function is this. Now, 2k is also a constant anyway. You can say let the constant 2k be equal to another constant c. So this could be c over s raised to power 3, where s is the Laplacian variable. Okay, whenever you're going taking stuff from, now you notice here that in, in, a, time, in a time domain, 
the dependent the independent variable is time t but in laplacian domain the independent variable is s i won't really spend a lot of time in laplace transform because of you know we don't have enough resources okay i think i have moved really fast now so now there are two general orders of the system now we have the first order system which is what you have here in the first order system you have this we have a reference input the control output and then we have a feedback loop now in the feedback loop where there is no block in the feedback is called a unit feedback loop okay now the fundamental forward gain is represented by this expression one over st where t is the time constant of the system okay by the time you resolve this feedback loop using the g of s over one plus g of s this is what you are going to have so this is the forward now the, the for a first order system the forward path gain or should i say the open loop gain or the open loop transfer function is one over one plus st while for a second order system you have this you have an angular frequency or a natural frequency omega n and then you have this parameter this data is in most tests you're going to see zeta not delta okay you're going to see zeta not delta and then by the time you resolve the closed loop here you're going to have an open loop transfer function of c of s over r of s equals to omega n squared over s squared plus 2 zeta now you see here now it is properly represented here i apologize for the discrepancy this should be zeta too i apologize for the discrepancy and then this gives you that now we're going to come back to this when we are doing our matlab uh, analysis application yes <clears throat> now this is a graphical representation of the two systems now on the left hand side we have a first order system <clears throat> and on the right hand side we have a second order system in a second order system we have four major forms we have the on time system in that case your parameter delta or your zeta in this case which is also known as the damping ratio is equal to zero for this undamped frequency or your undamped vibration or your undamped system the parameter zeta is zero for an underdamped system your parameter zeta is less than zero sorry about that it's less than one but greater than zero now in a critically damped system your parameter zeta is equal to one and in that case the system goes from its response almost instantaneously now your critically damped system has a fastest response okay comparative relatively speaking of course and in an over damped system your parameter zeta which is the damping ratio or the damping factor is greater than one and then in this in this case that your system takes the least time to settle okay you see here now on that system the system never settles in a creek in an under dam system you see here this vibration here it goes it doesn't settle until around this point but for a critically dam system it settles quickest while an over dam system where zeta is greater than one settles the slowest now that's for a second order system and there are actually parameters for describing the function or, or, or the anatomy or the different parts of a of an under dam system now you are going to see some parameters here m P. now this parameter p m sub 3 p is the peak overshoot now note the, this system this is a response this sinusoidal function this damp sinusoidal function is a response while the horizontal line of one is a stepped impute <coughs> excuse me horizontal line of one is a stepped impute this is the stepped impute okay now in the first cycle for another that system your system tends to do what it tends to overshoot the impute and the measure by which it overshoots the input don't mind, don't forget that this is the input and is the response so the maximum amplitude above the input is called the maximum overshoot and then we have the delay time the delay time is is a, how do i put it now is is the time taken for your response to reach 50 percent of the input this is the input and this is the 50 percent of the input so trace that to the curve to the response and take it down mind you this is measured with respect to time and then we have the rise time the rise time is time taken for a system to either reach now for some system you can actually define that as the time taken to meet the output okay but you will notice that in this system it is time taken to reach about 90 percent of the output as you will see here okay for some system for 90 percent of for it, the time taken for the output to reach 90 percent of the input sorry or if for other system it is defined as the time taken to reach 100 percent 
of the output. And then we have the peak time. With peak time, the time begins to reach the peak overshoot. And last, we have the settling time. The settling time is the time it, take, is the time it takes to transition from the transient phase into the, uh, what's it called now, the steady state phase. Now, if this were to go on for an infinite period of time, you notice that at some point, the oscillation will stop. So the point at which the oscillation stops beyond is called the steady state phase. But when, when you still have the oscillation, that is the transient phase. And lastly, we have the error, as you can see. As, it, as this set to the, see that it's turning, the error is turning towards zero. In other words, it is going to meet the input at some point. Okay, so the error is the difference between the output and the input at any given time. That's E of T. But the error, after, after your system has settled down and it's in a steady state, the error is known as the steady state error. Is that all right? And then that is for the second order system. I have to explain it first because it looks a little bit more interesting and more enticing. Don't mind me. Okay, now, the left-hand side gives us the, the first order system. In a first order system, a first order system behaves somewhat like a critically damped system. But it's not exact. It's not the same thing. Okay. Mind you, a first order system does not have the same thing. It only have a time constant. It does not have... A, an angular frequency, it does not oscillate, and it does not have a damping ratio, as you can see here. So the principal parameter in your first order system, in the rest of the first order system, is the time constant. And as you see here, this, sorry about this, this is not very clear, this is 0 0.632. The time constant is the time taken for your system to do what? To reach 0 0.632 or CSI is 3.2% of the input. Now you see in the upper image here that we have two figures. The blue one is the input. That is, this. in this case, you see that this is stepped input. Okay? And this is the green line is the response for a first order system. This is how a first order system responds to a stepped input. Okay? Now you can also define other things such as the, the what's it called now? The, the, the rise time and the settling time but then it does not have the peak overshoot and the peak time do you understand so i have to move fast oh i'm already out of time but then we have not even gotten the interesting part here please bear with me i'll try to make this as snappy as possible without spoiling the fun now i want to model a case study i was supposed to have multiple case studies but because of time i really didn't go into all of that okay and because of time also i'm going to skip a lot of this concept but then I'm gonna make sure I provide a link to this material maybe I don't know maybe I'm gonna have a maybe a Dropbox link or a Google Drive link it's gonna be inserted I think we should do that we're gonna do that we're gonna insert it put it in the video description we're gonna upload it and then you can download it and explore for yourself okay let me go back to where I was I'm gonna skip some studies now for those of you in say maybe 300 400 level this should be familiar. You must have come across something like this in mechanical vibrations. Okay, you must have come across something like this in mechanical vibration, and this is very important. Okay, now, because of time, I won't go into the deconstruction, but then by the time, this is like the, this is um, the system diagram, and these are free body diagrams. Now, the left-hand free body diagram models the first mass. And the forces acting on the mass, we have the spring force, the damping force, the external force F of T, and the inertial force, as you can see here. Now, for the right hand side, that is the mass M2, the forces acting on the spring force connecting it to M1, which is what we have here, the damping force connected to M1, which is what we have here, and then K2, which is a spring force connecting M2 to the fixed or the fixture here, and then we have the inertial force. And then we have the damping force due to this damper B2. Now B2, K2, K1, B1 are all constant. M1 is a constant, M2 is a constant. And F of T can also be, it can be any kind of constant, can it be any type, can be a, a step force, it can have a step force, it can have an impulse force, it can actually have a sinusoidal function of force too. There are several possibilities you have here. Okay? Now when these are modeled, you can extract the force equations here. Now, this is the force equation or the equilibrium equation for, M, for mass M1. 
okay and by the time we take the laplacian transform of each of these parameters what do we have and we rearrange we're going to have this don't worry I, I, I like i said i'm going to talk to um the leaders of your of of, of nine key and probably they're going to make this available so you can actually play around with it okay so this is the <coughs> laplacian transform for body one and this is laplacian transform body two that is obtained from the equilibrium equation mind you the laplacian is obtained from the equilibrium equation this is the differential equation that describes body one differential equation that describes body two and for in each case there is a laplacian transform that is derived from the differential equation okay and that's what you have now you can put this into a system of equations as you have here <coughs> as a matrix remember you have variables x1 and x2 as you can see here x1 x2 x1 x2 yes this is x1 x2 and it's easy for you to transpose the two and you have what you have here is going to be a matrix does that make sense to you this is a matrix and then depending on the parameters you want to model now in most cases or in a lot of cases in a lot of cases when you have this mass you want to model oh i'm sorry about that i should have mod i should have indicated x1 as displacement of m1 and x2 as this, this x1 as the of x m, x m1 and x2 as the of m2 I'm sorry i didn't indicate that but please take note of that okay so usually you want to see okay what is the stability <clears throat> or the response what is the response how will the displacement of m1 behave with respect to f f of t that is very important in most systems something like this you want to see the output you say okay let x1 be the output how does x1 now don't forget that x1 displacement of m1 that can be considered as an output so in that case <clears throat> you want to model the output being x1 or the displacement of m1 with respect to the impulse now the impulse to this system is the force f of t and the output one of the outputs by the way is displacement of mass one now i can say okay you know what i'm not interested in mass one i'm interested in mass two so you can actually model the response or the output that is the displacement of x2 with respect to the input force okay now this is very important and by the way this is actually this this system has defined practical application in several things using earthquake buildings you actually use it in automobiles so now that's like a very common place where you use this kind of mass damping system okay you have a damper or a dashboard and you have a spring and then of course the mass is going to be the vehicle itself now this is one of many systems you can model you can actually model a diesel motor i was supposed i was going to include something along the line of a diesel motor but then I, the time i have won't allow me to actually go into that so i decided to skip that okay so my so you can actually by the time you solve this system of equations you don't even have to solve it with matrix actually you don't even use, need to use matrix you can actually solve it by substitution okay you can substitute and by the time you solve it you're going to have these two solutions x1 equal to this and x2 equal to that and then you can actually express this as a gain or it's a transfer function remember the transfer function is the output over the input now the output in this case that is for this i'm taking my output as x1 over the input that's f of s or f of t taken to the laplacian domain becomes f of s and that gives me this transfer function so this is a transfer function that describes the relationship between the output or the display of x of m1 with respect to the input force okay and secondly or the other possibility is modeling the response of the displacement of m2 with respect to the input force f of f of f of t and in that case this output over input giving us a transfer function now i'm going to take one of these and make it my case study much later in the matlab uh, in the matlab application i'm going to talk about uh, much later so i'm going to stop there for now now the thing is this now remember what i said in the performance of the system number one you, you you the cost number two let's go back there so we have a clear picture performance of a system oh sorry i think i went past that yes sorry about that now we talk about the error associated so if error is going to be considered that means in most cases you won't use first order system sorry open loop system not first order system sorry about that 
use open loop system. Okay. In most cases, you want to use open loop system. Let's say, for example, your switch. For example, your, it, it, your the switch you used to put on your light or your your fan, your regular fan, is not a very it's not a very sophisticated application. So it's more like an open loop system. Just put in something and you get an output. You don't need to know anything as such. You know. Now the other part is the response. Now the response what I just discussed briefly. And then the more important part, in most cases, the stability. Now stability is like a key thing. How stable is the output with respect to the input? Now this is the foundation of a lot of things in control systems. Once you're able to quantify and analyze the stability of a system, when you have to quantify and analyze the stability of a system, then it becomes very, very easy to tweak the parameters so you can actually get some measure of good performance. Don't worry, I'm going to explain that concept when we start applying. But stability is a very important thing, and we're going to be turning on this a little bit in the application. Okay, now, there are different methods of like, okay, basically, for control system, stability is is defined okay let, let me not go the let me just go straight to the engineering way a, a system is said to be <coughs> sorry it's said to be stable if a bounded input yields a bounded output what does that mean it means if you have a, a definite finite input the output does not continue indefinitely okay in other words the output actually behaves in a specified specific manner what do i mean let me show you something here now i'm still going to explain this figure but i want you to illustrate the concept of stability now look at this system you see that the response is increasing with time obviously this is an unstable system for a given input the output is increasing infinitely so that system is unstable but compared to this this is a marginally stable system why because it is neither increasing nor decreasing the system output or the system response is neither increasing nor decreasing. Unlike here, in a stable system, for a given input, what happens? The response decreases with time. And it's, at some point, it matches with, or emerges rather, with the input. Now, those are the three basic states of stability. And that's what we mean when we say that a bounded input gives a bounded output. Okay, now, this is what we mean by stability in that regard. Okay, and um, basically, a system also ought to be stable. When there is no input, then the system, the air response should be zero. And that's, in a way, can be like a paraphrasing of Newton's first law of motion. Remember, a system remains in a state of rest of uniform motion, except acting upon by an external force. We can say that when a body remains in a state of rest, when there is no force acting on it, then that is what? That is um, uh, uh, stability. Okay, but then if it remains in a state of continual motion with no external force, that is relating to marginal stability. In the marginal, in the marginal stability scenario, the system is neither stable nor stable. It, it actually has a tendency towards instability. Is that clear? So we're going to talk about, I won't really spend a lot of time talking about this. I'm going to get down to this later. Okay, now, um, there are different methods for evaluating stability. We have the route Howitt criterion. Now, that's a matrix. Now, this is what you have here. What you have on the screen right now is a route Howitt criterion. Now, when you have a route array, as you have a characteristic equation. Now, the characteristic equation of a system is the denominator of the transfer function. Okay? I'm going to explain that practically later. Please bear with me. I don't want to jump into mathematical analysis ahead of time or let me just show you now assuming you have something like this now look at this as it is now look at this equation now this is a transfer function for a given system assume it's a transfer function for a given system the characteristic equation of this system is this denominator that is s cubed plus 18 x squared plus 10 x plus 28 equal to zero that will be the characteristic equation okay now we're also talking about stability you also have to know that there's a concept called zeros the zeros of your equation the zeros of your of a system are the roots of the numerator of the transfer function. Okay, and then we have to understand the concept of poles too. Now, the poles of an equation of, of, of a transfer function are the roots of the denominator. The zeros are the roots of the numerator. The poles are the roots of the denominator. We're going to come back to that later. Please take note of that. 
and that is what I was trying to explain here. So, whenever you are constructing your route, how it's array, you use the characteristic equation that is the denominator of product is zero, and then you put it in an array like this. Now, mind you, you see that all the even terms are placed in the first row, the odd terms are placed in the second row. Now, the subsequent terms are obtained by matrix determinant. In order for me to obtain B1, I have to use A0, A1, A2, and A1, which is what I have here. To obtain B3, now mind you, we have to be very careful. I use A0, A1, and then A4, A5. I do not use A2, A3. Is that clear? Now, to obtain B5, in this case, I'm going to use A2, A3, and if, this is probably going to be A6, A7. That's for B5. Now, the same thing goes for C1, C3, C5, and subsequent values. Now, having obtained or derived your route array, how do you tell if the system is stable? Number one, the system is stable if all the elements in the first row have the same sign. <coughs> in other words, A0, A1, A, B1, C1, if everything are either positive or negative. But as soon as at least one of them is negative, then by default, the system is unstable. Okay? Now, the number of sign changes you have in that first row, the number of, okay, I've not talked about um, the, the S-plane. I'm going to talk about S-plane shortly, but that's a fundamental criteria. And then number two, take a very, uh, take a note of this. It's very important to take note of this. Now, if your characteristic equation is non-linear, that is, if any of the denominators is absent, then your system is automatically unstable. What do I mean? Let me go back to this equation I showed you. Now, looking at this, this, we can't say this is, assuming that one of these is missing, in other words, assuming we go from S cubed straight to S, and this S squared term, the question of S squared is zero, that means this system is automatically stable. I do not need to construct a route array to determine that. I hope that is clear. So I'm going to stop there on the stability of route array. Like I said, we're going to make this available, I hope, hopefully. Probably to a good drive and you can download and actually play around with it your, on your own. Now, and then, there's another way for determining stability. Now, the root locus, okay, the root locus, then we have other frequency-based technical pull-up plots, the both plots, and the Nyquist diagram, and we're not going to be talking about most of this, but in this study, I'm going to apply only the polar-based plots, and then there's a concept called the S-plane. And now, this is the S-plane. The S-plane is a plot of your poles and zeros. I'm going to explain that. Take it easy. Now, what is the S-plane? Now, look at your equation. See this equation, for example. Remember what I said about the zeros. The zeros are the roots of the numerator, while the poles are the roots of the denominator. Is that all right? The roots of the numerator are called zeros. The roots of the denominator are called poles. Now, for any system, now, when you have the roots, you then plot them on the S-plane. And that is a major determinant of the stability of the system. I'm just going to explain what all of this means. But when we get to the application, then you are going to see it practically. Now, it is, whenever, I, now, one, another thing you also notice is that when determining the um, stability of a system, what you usually consider is the poles, that is the root of the denominator. Okay? Now, when your poles are anywhere in the right-hand side of the S-plane, <clears throat> and by the way, the right-hand side is anything beyond the imaginary axis. Okay, if anything is beyond the imaginary axis, then it's to the right-hand side. That is beyond it to the right. Anything beyond the imaginary axis to the left is <clears throat> to the left. In other words, so based on that understanding, note that anything to the right of the imaginary axis is unstable. RHP is means right-hand plane. And anything to the left of the imaginary axis is stable. Okay, in other words, you will see, obviously we see that when your zeros are negative, then there will be, you have, all your zeros, I mean, then your system is stable. But then when, even if one of your zeros is, I said, sorry about that, when your poles are all negative, your system is stable. But when at least one of your poles is positive, your system is unstable. I'm going to repeat that. When, when all your poles are negative, that is to the left-hand side of the imaginary axis, 
then you have a stable system. In other words, you have negative roots. But when any one of them is positive, then automatically it lies in the right hand side and then your system will be considered unstable. Is that all right? But then there's another issue here. What if you have a pole on the imaginary axis? Now, when you have a single pole or two poles on the imaginary axis, your system is marginally stable, as you can see here. If you have, in a lot of cases, you can actually have mirrored axis. That is, you can have one here and one here. Okay? But when you have two... Uh, what's going on? When you have two poles on the imaginary axis, then your system is marginally stable. When you have two poles on the imaginary axis, your system is marginally stable. But, but, if you have two poles on the same point, on the imaginary axis, your system is unstable. Now, you will see that this figure should keep places some graphs beside, behind this point, because the, this graph, this kind of function, will produce a Laplacian solution that looks like that will be placed here. Okay? A system that has this behavior will have its pole in the left-hand side of the axis somewhere around here okay that is in the the second quadrant as I mean it's first second third fourth quadrant okay but a system that has this behavior we have its pole somewhere around here okay a system <clears throat> that has a marginally stable system marginally stable system as you can see this is a marginally stable system it's an undamped response so you have something like that here on the marginal axis same thing goes for here okay but then at the origin when you have s equal to zero, that means you have a step in a, a step response, something like this. But when you have a ramped response like this, that means it is on the real axis, which is still on the right hand side. You're gonna have an unstable system because the response keeps increasing infinitely. Same thing happens when you have a parabolic function going this way. Okay? But when you have an exponential function like this, that means you have one of the s on the negative real axis, which makes it unstable. Sorry, make me stable rather, and this is also stable. So, sorry about the way I'm rushing the concepts. I kind of conscious of time. I want us to quickly get to the application because that's where it gets really interesting. Okay? So, I'm going to skip all of that for now. All of this, I'm going to point that out in the application. Now, let's go on to some really interesting stuff. Now, let's say you want to play around. You have a transfer function, you have a system, and let me just quickly scroll through the case studies you have to deal with. I think I have about five slides of this, one, two, three. Yeah, this is a practical application, four and five. Now, this last one is like trying to apply the concept of the mass damping system like we had in the case study. We are trying to consider a practical scenario and solving the problem of MATLAB. Is that all right? Okay, now, now I'm still going to play with. I'm going to play with a fundamental system like this. Now let's table our system carefully. It's really important we understand this. Okay, maybe I'm going to share my screen. Escape, and I'm going to. Um, okay, let me make sure I'm still recording. Oh, good, we're still recording. <laughs> One hour gone. Wow. Okay, okay. Now, let's quickly play with MATLAB a little. Okay, now, we want to determine the poles, the zeros, and the gain, or the transfer function of the system. Okay? Oh, I don't think there's a way I can make that work. Okay, let me just play with what I have. Now, let me save, let me select my working directory first. Working directory, working directory, working directory. Or let me just no let me not waste time let me just go straight to what I have to do okay okay now look at this see you have a you have this G of s or the open loop transfer function given here I lighten this with my mouse okay and you want to determine the poles the zeros okay and the gain of the system now the gain of the system is when what would be the value of this V? I'm going to show that later, shortly, okay? The gain of the system, that is by how much, or by what factor, 
is the output amplified with respect to the inputs. That is the gain. By how much, or what's the factor by which the output is amplified with respect to the inputs? Okay. I hope you understand that. Mind you, let me quickly try to show you what this is trying to do. What's an equal to it? I'm going to do that quickly. Now, this is, um, that is the controlled output. That is C. Oh. C of S over um, uh, R of S. So I hope that is clear. So this is the open refractor function for a system. Now this shows you that a system has been reduced to this. Okay, so this is the transfer function of gain. So, so from in system, so that, system transfer function or Gain. Oh, come on. Sorry about that. Or gain. So that is what that is. Okay. I'm, this is just elementary level. I'm going to take it. I'm going to go more advanced as we proceed. Okay, yes. Now, as we have a system, so how do you deal with the problem? So this is MATLAB. I want to believe that you guys are familiar with MATLAB. And as an alternative to the MATLAB <coughs> programming interface, you can, act there, you can actually try to do this in Simulink. Simulink is actually more intuitive. And as a GU, a graphical interface, where you get to visualize results in a unique way. <coughs> but I prefer to use this at least for this study. Maybe in some more subsequent uh, time, we're going to do something interesting. Now, let me say, that's a MATLAB script. Let me say, let me say exercise one. Um, yes, okay. Okay, let me just put it here because of time. Oh, come on. Okay, documents. Okay, I think I have a MATLAB. Okay, now, let me see it here. Good. Now, now, the first thing, I have a numerator and denominator, and I'm trying to obtain the poles, the zeros, and the gain from this. Now, first of all, I'm going to define the numerator as... Now, how do I define the numerator? <clears throat> I'm going to take the coefficients, 1s squared, 5s and 14. The coefficients here are 1, 5, and 14. I'm going to put it into an array, as you can see here. OK? And then, what's that? Now, I just I put this um, syntax here so that you probably follow and see where I'm going with this. OK, 1, make sure there is space, 5, space, 14. Now I've defined the numerator. Now MATLAB sees this as 1s squared, 5s, 14. MATLAB takes it linearly. Assuming this s squared plus 14. My limit is for s squared plus 14. I'm just going to make it 1, 0, 14. That's very important. Assuming it's just s squared plus 14, please take note, it's going to be 1, 0, 14. But in this case, I want 1, 5, and 14. So I'm making it 5. So I hope you understand that. <clears throat> and then and it's important you put the semicolon here so that it won't display each line it's trying to. By the time I'm combining the code, it won't display each line. So the denominator, what are the coefficients? I have 1 s cubed, 18 s squared, 10 s, and 28. So I'm going to define that also as an array. So we have 1, 18, and then we have 10, and then we have uh, 28. Okay? My semicolon. Okay, now I'm going to pass the poles, the zeros. And again into an array <clears throat> and that is Z stands for the poles now I can make it Z space P space K okay in other words I can okay let, let me this is also an array but let me just use a comma instead of a space so that the same thing the comma does the same thing as the space you had here okay equal to now the, the MATLAB function for obtaining this three parameters in the array automatically is tf2 as you can see on the slide zp <clears throat> and then i pass that into a tuple if you're familiar with um, python programming numerator comma 
denominator. Now the order is very important. Okay, and then I run this. Okay. Okay, good. You see that I made a mistake with the <clears throat> with the spelling denominator rather. So you see that now. Look at my poles. Now the zeros. <clears throat> now I'm going to come back to this, but let's just follow stepwise. Now the zeros that is the root of the numerator are what this minus two point five plus two point seven eight three nine i. In other words, it is complex. The zeros of this equation is a complex number. This and this. <clears throat> And of course, these are mirrors of each other. <coughs> Excuse me. And then the poles now, which are the roots of the denominator, are three, as you can see. Since the uh, what's it called now? This is a cubic equation, so we're going to have three roots. So you can see now, these are all complex numbers too. I hope that's clear now. Okay. Now, what if we have a case? Now let me open another script. I'm going to save again. So um, documents. MATLAB and then E2 E2 now in the second case that you have here now you are given the zeros you have the poles and you have the gain oh I didn't point out the gain for the previous one the gain in this case is 1 in other words is a direct translation this has a gain of 1 the output is not greater by from it's not greater than the input by anybody they are more or less equivalent in the manner of speaking the output signal is equivalent to the input signal in, in the order of magnitude. In the order of magnitude. Now, assuming you have a case where you are given the zeros, you are given the poles, you are given the gain, and then you want to, shall I say, obtain the equation itself. What do you do? Now, the things that I have here, I define an array for zero. Let's say Z stands for zeros, and I define an array. Now, assuming the zeros are, let me put it here. Zeros are minus three, and let's say minus eight, as you can see there. Minus eight, and then okay. okay, I don't want to do that. Those are zero minus five, so we have zero minus five. Let me just read it up a little. Let's say we have nine, and then we have um. Let's say 11. I'm not doing exactly the same thing as I have here, so don't mind me. So you see here, you see here, it's obvious here that this, the poles, which are supposed, we have four roots or four poles. That means I'm going to have four, or should I say, fourth order uh, denominator or characteristic equation. What do I mean? Let's go. So we have minus three and eight, minus three, and then we have minus eight. So and then my poles be equal to um, 0 minus 5 minus okay I said I'm gonna switch it up a little 9 and 11 okay now and then my gain k let's say gain is equal to 2 and then now I'm gonna pass this into an array Defined as numerator, let me say n, n u, and d e. n u stands for numerator, d e stands for denominator, and that is passed into the reverse function. Remember the first function here we used t f two z p. In this case, we're going to use z p two t f. So we're going to use z p that is pole zero to transfer function of z p k z zeros. P poles k gain. Okay, now MATLAB does not recognize or cannot print straight away. So there's a there's a printing function that allows you to print mathematical expressions the way mathematical expression we appear and it's called a system function. So I'm not just going to use the ordinary print. For those of you that are not familiar with um, programming or MATLAB programming stuff, please bear with me. So I won't use the ordinary print function. I'm going to use print system function. Now, print system actually allows me to print my function in a way that looks like a mathematical expression. Okay, so I'm going to pass numerator and denominator into a tuple, and then I'm going to find that as print as is S. S refers this printing function 
sorry, S refers these two variables to the print system function. And by the time you run that, you see that. So now where is our problem? A column vector, okay. Okay, okay, okay. Z must contain a column vector. Uh, wait, I made a mistake. Oh, yes, there's a mistake. Now, note, it has to be a column vector. Now, this is a row vector. Now, the way you change this to a column vector is, is of, you use semicolons. Now, let's go back. Let me show you something. Now, in this case, this is a row vector. Refers to this one now. This is a row because you have 154 on the horizontal. But then, the result you get are actually column vectors. You can see here, these are not displayed on, the, on a row. It's displayed vertically. This is Z1 and this is Z2 or Z1, Z2, as you choose to call it. And this is P1, P1, P2, P3. Now, these are, row, these are column vectors compared to this that are row vectors, okay? Row vectors, column vectors. I hope that's clear. Now, I have to make a correction here. Now, this has to be changed to a row vectors by using semicolon instead of commas or spaces. So when I do that, so by the time I run this, I have my results. Okay. Do you see that? I, I, you can see what I'm saying now. This is a numerator. That is the coefficient of a numerator. And this is the coefficient of a denominator. Are we together? You can see that this has five parameters here. This also has five. The reason why you have zero, zero here is because it tries to match the numerator with the denominator. So we have zero s raised to bar five. So s raised to bar four plus zero s raised to bar three plus two s raised to bar two, which is what you have here. Okay, plus 22s plus 48, all over s raised to bar four minus 15s raised to bar three minus s squared minus one s squared plus 495 plus zero. The constant is zero for the numerator. So the characteristic equation is this denominator. Do you understand? So for this particular expression. This is the character expression that, point that I just highlighted as denominator. I hope that's clear. So let's go one step further. Let me see. Oh, haha. <laughs> I really hope you're enjoying this. I didn't intend to take this much time, but I hope you're finding this insightful. We should wrap this up in the next, uh, let me see, um, next 15 minutes or so. I just want to be sure. Okay, now. Now let's do something that is a little bit more complex, okay? Now. So let's say call that E3, example three, documents. So let's say E3. Now, given what you have here, sorry, I'm trying to make that clearer. Now, given this, oh, come on. Sorry about that. Now, given this transfer function, Given this transfer function, okay. Now you want to obtain what you've been doing all this while, okay. Now you will notice that there's a new. Okay, let me not get that there's a new function. Okay. You want to obtain probably the gain for this transfer function. You want to obtain the gain. Come on. You want to obtain the gain. The what else do you want to obtain? The poles and zeros. Actually, it's obvious you should be able to get the poles and zeros here. The poles here are s equal to 0, s equal to minus 4, and s equal to minus 8. While in this case, for the numerator, the zeros are s equal to minus 3 and s equal to minus 5. Now, let's try to implement that in MATLAB. So, we define the numerator, okay? But then you notice that the numerator is in compartments, so to speak, or in parts. We have the first part is 1, 6, second part is s plus 3, and the third part is s plus 5. This is a factorized polynomial. That's what it gives for the poles and the zeros. So now let's do that very quickly. Let me use n1, as you can see. My slide n1 equal to 6. Do I need to define that? Okay, let me define that. n1 equal to 6. Let me do that, okay? Now, n2 equal to... Now, I define this as an array. And this also has to be an array. Remember, we are passing it into a function. So that's 6, not just a constant. Is that all right? Okay? Now, um, now, what would be in the what would be the coefficient matrix for the second part of the numerator? That's going to be one and three. I hope that's clear. Okay, and then we have the fourth part, 
equal to equal to one and five. That is this part you have here. Okay. Now that's for the numerator. Now let's define the denominator. We have um for the denominator we have uh let's say d1 equal to um now in this case you're gonna have one comma zero. Okay, one s plus zero constant. I hope that's clear. One s plus zero constant, that is what represents this s all by itself. One s plus zero constant is very important you pay a point to that. And then we have d2 and then we have um What's that? 1 comma 4. Is that all right? 1 comma 4. In other words, this. And then the last one is going to be 1 comma 8. Okay? So we have D3. D3. Let me make sure that's properly aligned. 1 comma 8. I can use 1 8, you know, depending on what I choose. Now, good. Now, how do I multiply? You're going to notice there's a new function. How do I multiply this three? There's a function called CONV, which is what you have here. Conf function. Now, let me do this. I'm going to say D1. Now, this, that is denominator 1. Oh, let me, let me say DEN1. Okay. Or well, let me just switch denominator. Now, denominator equal to conv. Sorry about that. Come find a tuple. Now n1. Let's say n1, comma n2. Do you understand? Okay. Now your comp function only takes in two. Only takes in two. What's it called now? Two variables. Okay. And you're going to see what I'm trying to do here. Convert. Okay. Comma. Ah. Okay. That should be N three. Okay. Now what am I trying to do here? I'm trying to combine these three. First of all, I multiply the first and second with the com function. Okay. C O M function multiplies first and second. Is that all right? And then, I then the result of multiplying these first two or bringing them together, it is then factored in with this third one. Do you understand? So when I print this, I'm going to have this, okay? Okay, I think I have a problem there. Okay, Miss Margin. Uh, okay. Okay. I'm coming, I'm coming, I'm coming. Um, Okay, you know what, let's break it down. Let me break this down. Let me break this down, break this down, break this down. Because of time, I don't want to waste time. Okay, good. Now, let me, let me use to, um, okay, yeah. Let me call it the DN1. Now, I was doing, oh, sorry, that's with the numerator. Numerator one, let's say. Then, the numerator is gonna be, um, now let's say six. What is n one? Come num one, comma n three. Now let me see. Oh, good. That is the numerator. Okay. First of all. I brought one and two, and then I brought in three and four. Is that all right? So you're going to see that it's going to be what? 6x squared plus 48s plus 90. 6x squared plus 48s plus 90. That's what this stands for. Is that all right? So by the time you do it, like you, you probably try to multiply that, I'm going to see x squared plus, you're going to see what I'm trying to say. Okay, x squared plus, uh, let's see now, x squared plus 8s plus 15. You see that x squared plus 8s plus 16, that I'm talking about this. So by the time you multiply x squared plus 8s plus 16 by 6, you're going to have 6x squared plus 6 times 8, 48, and 6 times 15 will give you 90. I hope that's clear. So let me move on to the denominator. Oh, God. I really want to finish this on time. Okay, so 
So for the denominator, let's say D1 is equal to um, under C, under V, under V, delete. Okay, now D1, now D1 is what? 0, comma S. Don't forget that. Sorry, 1, comma 0. Oh, it's been defined. Sorry, I'm in a hurry. I really should slow down. Let's say then one. So we have C O N V. So what goes in there? We have D1, D2. D1, comma, D, D2. And then we have the nominator proper now. It's going to be C O N V of D N1. D N1, comma, um, D E N. Sorry, D3. So I'm testing my code in pieces. You can see this, I'm testing my code in bits. So you see here, so good. Now, let's move on. Now, let's uh, obtain system transfer function. Now, I'm going to try to do the system printing in a different way, okay? So don't mind me. SYS equal to TF. Now, TF is what you use to combine two a fraction into a transfer function. So we have TF of numerator and then denominator, okay? Okay, we get that and then I'm going to print this, print this and then numerator, denominator. Yeah, yeah, and then good. Now, let's check this out. Do we see that? So that is our transfer function that is, you know, printed in a realistic manner. Now, I'm going to bring in a new concept. Now, the concept of stability. Remember what I said about the stability? Now, this is where this becomes very important. Now, we're going to apply this. Okay. So, we're going to apply this now. Okay. Now, look at this very carefully. You probably sketch this out somewhere. Take note of where all these things are located. Okay. Now, where was I? Where was I? Where was I? Was I here? No, I wasn't here, no. Yeah, good. Now, let me try to implement this. Now, I'm going to use a PZ math function. Now, the PZ math function is used to, it is used to um, automatically generate the values of the poles and zeros placed on the S plane. Okay, so I'm going to put in the transfer function SYS, which is the transfer function of Newton and Newton. I'm going to put in PZ math. Okay, I'm going to print the pole zero mark for this, for V. So by the time I do this, busy, you can see it's busy here. It's trying to generate the pole zero mark. Good. Okay, now look at this. <clears throat> now compare what you have here. Now what are the, now don't forget we are dealing with this. Now the poles are represented by these crosses. These two crosses are poles. Why the zeros are written by these zeros? So we have three crosses. One pole, another pole, and then another pole. One zero, and then another. In fact, my MATLAB is actually highlighting it for me. We can see here, the zeros are minus three and minus five, which is what we have here. Minus five, minus three. Oh, come on. This is what? Minus five, minus 3. And then for the zeros, we have s equal to 0, s equal to minus 4, and s equal to minus 8. Okay? s equal to... Wait, I hope I am on the right... Yeah. Yeah. s equal to 0. That is on the, at the origin. You can see this is the origin. This is imaginary axis. Please don't make a mistake. This is imaginary axis. This is the imaginary axis. This is imaginary axis. Okay? So this is s equal to 0. And then this is s equal to minus 4. Oh, I switch it up, right? Yeah. Yes, s equal to minus 4 and then s equal to minus 8, as you can see. So, what can we see about the stability of the system? All the poles are in the left-hand side, that they are to the left of the imaginary axis. As a result, this system is stable except for one that is on the imaginary axis. 
what does that tell us? This system is marginally stable. Remember what we said? If just one of the poles is on the imaginary axis, right? What does that mean? Automatically, the system is marginally stable. Okay? Let me see how far we've gone. Okay. Shouldn't spend more than two hours here, okay? So that's that. I'm done. I'm going to rush. So play around with it in your free time. I'm going to do this last. Now, this is a practical example. This is a practical example. We're dealing with here. Let's say you have a block diagram and you have to reduce it using MATLAB. Or should I do this first? Okay, you know what? Let me. I'm, 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 not, I'm going to stop this video, this broadcast, not less than two hours. I think I already overshot the time. But then I can't really finish without this. But notwithstanding, let me go to the practical application first. And if I have a few more minutes after that, then, then I can talk about this very, very briefly. I'm going to talk about this briefly. We're just going to probably play around with it and see. Good. Now, let me go to application. Now, this looks familiar, right? Where does this appear? This is, as we said earlier, this is the definition. Don't forget this. Right? And then we had this. And then finally we had this. We said this, as it is, is the response of, this is the response of mass M1 relative to, the response of mass M1 relative to the impulse force F. So I had to put up my alarm. And then it's given by this transfer function. Now I want to see the stability of the response with respect to the input f of s. Now I'm going back to my case study. Now we assume for the mass system we had here, that is this, as we for this mass system, taking off all this, this all these have values, m1, m2, k2, k1, e1, b2, they all have their own values. And that's what I gave you. Assuming you have um let's the damping constant B. That's B1. I think I should have put B1 there. B equals 10, and then K1 is equal to um, 5 newton per meter. Newton per meter, and the mass that's M1 is 10 kilogram. Okay? Now, let's see how this behaves in that regard. If the system is stable, and then we can play with some other stuff. Is that alright? So, don't forget this is what we're dealing with. So, open another script. Oh, come on. Where was I? Document, MATLAB. Okay. So, this should be E4. So, good. Now, I'm going to copy all of these as descriptions of what I'm trying to do. Mind you, the percentage sign at the end kind of change the whole thing to, you know, comments and stuff. Oh, come on. Okay. Now, first of all, let's not forget, we define the numerator. Let's say the numerator is x1. So, an array, since what we have here is 1, right? Uh, let's just make it 1. Okay, let me make it clearer. Sorry. Okay. So, now what's the denominator? So let's call that f. Let's say f equal to define an array of the coefficients. Coefficients that now m1 is 10. Don't forget from our description 10 kilograms. And then we have uh, what's b1? That's also another 10. And then what's k1? That's a 5. Okay. Now we have that. Uh, okay. And now let's define a, a parameter g as the transfer function of this two, let's say x1, comma f. Okay? Do you understand? So I can actually say 
let me try this print print sys like we did earlier so we have um let me see if this works okay oh. so f sorry numerator first x1 comma f do you see that i believe that's clear okay now you see what i have highlighted here numerator denominator it's exactly what we have except that instead of having m1 b1 k1 now we now have the numerical values okay so we're going to go a step further so having done that let's try to obtain the poles and the zeros okay remember we're passing that into array and then again that's the uh, sorry z should come first z p k equal to and uh, that's don't forget the tf no not tf2 yeah sorry tf2 zp function and they pass that the tuple of the x1 right x1 and then uh, f is that all right so let's try this out good good so what do you see here now you see that we don't have any zeros that's obviously because the numerator here is there's no s variable there do you understand so you see here these are your roots now how would this one how would this be located on the s plane so i'm going to use my pz map function so i'm going to do pz map pz map of g don't forget g has wrapped x1 and f into a transfer function so i put g hey, sorry sk Sorry about that. So when you run this, still busy. Oh, I think we're done. Good. Now, what do you see? The poles. Look at them here. Don't forget, this is the imaginary axis. Okay. The poles are 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5 on the real axis, which is what you have here, <clears throat> and minus 0 0.5 on the imaginary axis, which is what we have here. So I'm plus zero minus 0 0.5 plus 0 0.5. Minus 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5. So this point here, as you can see, is the first pole P1. And this point here is the second pole what? P2. And since both I to the left of the imaginary axis, this is a stable response. In other words, X1 responds in a stable manner to F. In other words, <coughs> X1 reduces over time as we reach zero. Okay? X1 does what? It reduces over time. As we go towards zero, is that clear? So now let's try something else. Now, assuming um, I want to plot, I want to plot um, this. I want to plot the response in the time domain. I'm going to use the comma. That is the response. Now, assuming you have a stepped response of force. Assuming this force as it is now. I'm coming let me include it here so i'm always going to say as we have a force of one newton that is unit stepped force that is one newton i think i already put, oh it's here already i don't need to pull that let me just delete it there. so so we want to look at how this behaves how the system is going to be with respect to with respect to a unit step force so i'm going to use the step command step g Step G, and then I run. Voila. Now you see this now. Now, this is where you now start evaluating behavior. Okay, remember the first map? The first map we dealt with, the PZ map. That is really, that is stable. Now, look at the way it behaves now. Okay? Look at the way this behaves. It has a minimum overshoot. Okay, and it was the right time. Now I'm going to put in something else. The grid on, the grid on command, the grid on command. Make sure that <clears throat> good. Now, what are the metric? Now, what is the delay time? The delay time. Now this is the input. The input is what? Zero point two. Sorry, the maximum input level. The input threshold. Sorry, the input threshold is zero point two. 
Now, half of that is what? 0 0.1. Did you get that? The reference level, the reference input is what? Oh, the, I did, sorry, not the reference input. The threshold of the input is what? 0 0.2. That is what your response stabilizes to over time. Do you understand? Now, the delay time, remember the delay time is what? When you reach 50%, don't forget that, 50% of the threshold of the input. Now, the 50% of 0 0.2 is 0 0.1. By the time I put the marker here, what do I have? 0 2.02 seconds. Now, that is the delay time. Okay, now what's the rise time? The time it takes for this to meet, this will be the rise time. The rise time is 4.69 seconds, as you can see. Okay, that is the time it takes the response to meet the threshold of the input. And then the peak time will be somewhere around here. That is when you get the maximum value, 6.3 seconds. Now, obviously, this system is not a very, it's not a very sharp system. In other in the way of speaking, in other words, if you want your system, the mass to damp quickly. Something that takes two seconds, or should I say, that takes, um, wait, let me go over it again. That takes four seconds. One, two, three, four. For the outputs to meet the threshold of the input, then that's a really slow system. Now, that's where you start now playing around. You play around now, the mass is constant. You can't play with the mass. For any system you are designing, you can't touch the mass. The mass is constant, except probably it's allowed. But assuming you can allow to play with this, for example, no, you should be allowed to. You are trying to get a particular, I try to minimize the rise time, the response time, and all of those things. So probably you start playing with this and see the effect. Now, assuming this is not 10, assuming the, that's the mass, sorry, and this is B, that is the damping ratio. Assuming you reduce the damping ratio, what would it be like? Good. Now, look at this. I have a funny interest, I have an interesting behavior here. Now, obviously, you see now, I have reduced the response time to about, rise time, sorry, not response time, to 2.9. Initially it was 4.6, now 2.9. Now this is where it's really getting interesting. So you try, you try to tweak and manipulate, tweak those parameters, the stiffness of the spring, and this particular value here. Okay, let me see, I think I'm out of time now. Okay, I have three more minutes. I think I'm going to stop here because of time, I shouldn't exceed my time, but I hope you've learned something today. I really hope you have learned something uh, today. But then, the thing is this, like I said, I'm gonna make the slides available to the organizers. Okay, and then it, will, it should be included as um, a Google Drive link in the video description that you can play around with. I actually have my codes put here, embedded in the slide, so you can try them out and see this behavior. And you can actually read for that. I think I'm going to also look for further reading links and send it to the organizers. And when you're trying this, okay, I'm actually suppressing this plot command using this um, percentage sign. So if you want to see how this is going to look like, let me show you practically. Let me show you practically. Now, assume you want to plot something else. Assume you want to plot just the PZ map, the boat plot. We didn't get to that, but let me just try it anyway. Both G and you run. So this is going to show me the boat plot. Now that's a frequency kind of thing, but I'm not going to talk about this at least not for now. Now, assuming I want to see just the PC map and not see all of this, there are other techniques that I can use, but let, because of time, I won't go into all of that. I'm going to just put percentage here because it runs the last plot command. So I don't want to see that, I don't want to see this. I just run. So that takes me back to the PZ map. This is the pole zero map. This is the values now. And then this is the polar plot. So what you see here as this um, R versus theta kind of plot is a polar plot, but we didn't, we didn't get the time to talk about this. That's why we start talking about the marginal margin gain and phase gain and all sorts of things. So um, that will be all for this session. Yeah, I hope you've learned something, and I hope I wasn't so boring. But I, 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 I just like you to just go through the slides and try to implement the codes yourself. And I'm trying to, I'm going to try to get other materials for further reading. This is a very interesting thing. As long as you can model the system mathematically, you can get a differential equation that describes the system. It will be very easy for you to actually see how the response or the outputs of the system uh, behave with respect to the input. 
so that's just a general idea behind this whole uh, thing. And one last, okay, let me just leave that because of time. So it's two hours already. I hope you've enjoyed yourself. I and I say thank you to the uh, sponsors that made this possible. Uh, keep making a good use of uh, the period you're at home, and hopefully we get to talk.